we are now live. My name is Christina Hendricks, and uh, I'm moderating this discussion with David Wiley and others. And um, I'm going to post the link to join live if, but if people want to, and it will be on Twitter at the hashtag uh, hashtag why open in case any in case we don't get enough people because more people have signed up than have showed up. And so we'll wait a few minutes, and if anybody wants to join later, I will post that to the Why Open Twitter hashtag. And people should follow the Why Open Twitter hashtag and post questions. I am hearing something weird. Really? Oh, my God. I think I'm on the YouTube page. Hold on. <laughs> Recursion. Oh, I've, I have, I've I never have. done that before. <laughs> have you, done, you haven't done that before? I haven't done that three or four times before, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just closed it, and it's still going. <sighs> there we go. Okay, it's done. Sorry, everybody. That was very confusing, I'm sure, for your end. All right. <laughs> I'm no longer hearing myself twice. Okay, so, um, David, do you want to introduce yourself, or should we introduce the other people first? Maybe we'll introduce the other people first. So, Alan, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Hi, Christina. Alan Levine from uh, Strawberry, Arizona. And uh, I love Open. And I'm a big fan of David, so I want to hear what he had to say. <laughs> cool. And you, Christina. I'm a big fan of you. And I'm a big fan of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeanette, you want to go next? Oh, Hi. Um, go. Uh, I'm, I'm, yes, can you hear me? Yep, we're good now. Okay. Okay, great. I've just been having trouble uh, with my Wi-Fi. For some reason, it's acting up right now. Uh, so if I come and go, it's okay. Uh, it's not a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm co-facilitating this course with uh, Christina um, and a few others. I I think this is our second round, right, Christina? Mm -hmm. Right. So I currently um, I currently teach at an independent high school, and I have um, my PhD and hello. I can hear you. Am I still here? Okay, yep. I just got an error message on my screen, so I wasn't sure what was going on. Yeah, so I I design a lot of my classes using open educational resources. Um, not. Oh, now you froze. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wi-Fi. I'm on Wi-Fi too, but so far it's working. <laughs> You're back. You're back. Okay. Did you want to say anything else? No, no, no. That's it. Okay. Okay. That's it. okay cool. cool. Um, Paul. Paul Olivier. Sorry. <laughs> oh, can't hear you. You might be muted, Paul. Probably muted. He was muted, but now, but the little mute button came off. So Maybe now. your mic is turned down. Hmm. Can you hear us? <laughs> well, while you're while you're figuring it out, I forgot to introduce who I am. I mean, <laughs> I just said I'm running this, but <laughs> I teach philosophy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC, in Canada, and I just got interested in openness. Um, I don't know about a year and a half ago through taking some open online courses, including at MOOC Educational Technology and Media MOOC, and then I took DS106, and that's how I met Alan, and uh, I've taken a number of other things, so, and I helped run this course last year at this time as well with B2PU. So that's me. See, it just leads to harder stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you end up teaching open. I know, yeah. You, first you start doing it, and then you end up teaching it. All right, Paul, are you back yet? No. Okay. Well, you can you can contribute in the group chat if you want, and I can say what you wanted to say. So, David, why don't you introduce yourself? I could do it, but I think you can do a better job. <laughs> so, I'm David Wiley. Uh, the important facts about me are that I am originally from West Virginia, here in the States, and though I've lived in Utah for almost 16 years now, I still consider myself a West Virginian at heart. Um, I've been involved in the open education movement about as long as I've lived in Utah, basically. I think 
my first work on open content, I started the month after I moved here and started my graduate program uh, as a doc student in an educational technology program at BYU. And since then, um, I've bounced around and done a lot of things, but now I'm full-time with a, a group called Lumen Learning that helps institutions adopt open educational resources and use them effectively to displace you know, expensive commercial textbooks. And I'm an adjunct faculty member at Brigham Young University. Cool. All right. Thank you. So would you like to go ahead and maybe just say a few things about, um, well, I had asked you to talk about openness generally and then maybe something about the history of open. Um, for anybody who's somewhat new, and then anything else you wanted to say, and then we can have a conversation. Sure. Well, brief history of open. I, mean, I, I, I think the, the point that you have to at least go back to is you have to at least go back to Richard Stallman fighting with the printer. <laughs> okay. I, I think that's where the story really begins for, for our purposes. Is, All fights uh, with printers and bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to make a printer do something and then finding out that in this new release of the printer software, the drivers are closed and proprietary. They're no longer open source, and he can't create some custom print queue or whatever it was he was trying to, to do at the time. I don't remember the details of it. But it, it seems to be that that was the seminal experience that led to him having this idea of free software and identifying these uh, four freedoms um, that all, all of the later work is inspired by. right? So glossing over tons of things quickly, because this is meant to be a brief statement. Mm -hmm. From Richard, um, you know, Richard's work is very much about principle and uh, ethic and morality. And at some point, the, the message of either you should believe in the principles of free software or it means you're somehow an inferior human being <laughs> start to offend people. And, um, and between that offense and the use of the word free, free, the idea of free software was having a hard time taking root uh, outside the small community that it was, uh, you know, that it had started inside of it, incubated in. And so in the, in the winter of 98, a group of people got together and had a sort of a strategy meeting of how could we rebrand this to both focus more on the pragmatic benefits of this approach as opposed to the morality and the uh, the correctness of being open or of, of freedom in Richard's language and also how can we get away from the word free and so that's where the phrase open source came from is this February 98 meeting mm. Um, and so then you see what is still today a division of two primary camps, the free software camp and the open source camp, who um, you know, both, make you, both make use of the GPL license uh, a lot, which is the Free Software Foundation's license, Richard's license uh, for free software, but really focused on the idea of freedom and these four freedoms that, are, that Richard has canonized versus the open source definition which is the track that the open source community went, which is based on the Debian free software guidelines, um, which predated the OSD. And a after that work in software, there came work in content more broadly and then in education generally, and um, you know, trying to apply these principles in the context of education. And that's where a lot of my, that's where my work for the last 16 years has been. Of course, tons of other people working in the space. There are people who have taken kind of the free route and still focus on the principles of freedom and the, the morality and the principle of it. Um, I happen to be on the side that uses the open language and focus more on the benefits of the, the pragmatic <laughs> that, come, uh, that come to us when we adopt open approaches. Um, so that, that, I guess that's a brief history of where it came from. Uh, oh no, there are children. <laughs> They want to be open, too. <laughs> they want to be open. One of mine will come rolling through the door before this is all over yeah. or behind me. Um, you know, and, you know, so, so that's where open, but I guess the, the, I was just saying before we started the Hangout, I'm getting ready to teach my introduction to openness class in the fall again, which I haven't taught in a couple of years. And 
as I've been trying to think, what, what's the minimum amount of copyright history that people need to understand to really be able to appreciate what's going on mm. uh, with open and why we have the need for open? Um, it seems to me that one of the major turning points that we don't talk enough about is the Bern Convention. Mm. Uh, particularly when I, I'm going to talk from the U.S. context because it's the one I know. So my apologies to Christina and to to others that you know in other in other contexts. But when the U.S. became a signatory to Bern, um, a big shift happened. Up until up until Bern, anything that you created was just it was not copyrighted. Any kind of creative work that you made was just out there. And if you wanted to enjoy copyright protection in that work, you had to put a, you had to go to the Herculean effort of putting a C and a circle around that C somewhere on the document. Um, after the US became a signatory to Burn, that flipped over so that each and everything you create, the second after you create it, regardless of whether you want copyright protection or not, tough newbies for you, you get copyright protection. And we enter this world where if you want to share with other people, you actually have to go out of your way to legally enable sharing to happen, as opposed to the world before Burn, where the assumption was we were all making things and sharing them. And in that really odd case where you'd made something that you thought needed to be protected in terms of copyright, then you could copyright it. Now we live in this world where the crayon doodle that your two-year-old does that hangs on the refrigerator is just as copyrighted as you know, Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, and it's just ridiculous and completely out of control. Hmm. Can, yeah. David, can I interrupt you for a second? Would, yeah, you might have said this and I missed it, because I'm trying to multitask with inviting people. Um, when, did we, when did the U.S. We, when did the U.S. sign the Berne Convention? Well, Wikipedia will tell us. I want to say late uh, 70s, early 80s. Oh, that was pretty late. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's a fairly recent okay. uh, mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know about Canada. I haven't checked out Canada. On our part. I'm pulling it up right now. Okay. Just curious. Actually, I don't know. May, maybe somebody else will do it in the background so that I don't... Yeah, don't worry about it. I, I, I thought it might have been in, like, the 20s or something, so I... No, no, no. no. It's, it's fairly recent. It's fairly okay. recent. Okay. Um... You know, so now, as educators, and we're always creating things, and we, there's a culture among educators of sharing and trading worksheets and trading syllabi and lesson plans and all this sort of thing. Well, now we're just all violating each other's copyrights all over the place. Copyrights that, A, we don't want. You know, typically, a lot of us don't particularly want copyright protection in the things that we make. Um, we want to share. But now we have to go through all these extra hoops of applying open licenses and telling people that, yes, even though this copyright protection I didn't want has been forced on me, I'm still giving you permission to do all these things that I want you to do and that you want to do, and I'm sorry we have to go through all this garbage, but there's there's no way I can get out from, you know, I can't get out from under this ubiquitous assignment of uh, copyright to everything I create. So, yeah, um, that's interesting. That, that's yeah. part of, that's part of the reason that we need this focus on openness and open licensing. Before, when you know 99.999% of all the creative works that people made never entered, ne never received copyright protection, we could share them and remix them and do all the things that uh, you know that we we're trying to support now with open licensing. Yeah. But but now we actually have to go out of our way to make that happen. It's so hard to fathom some of the lengths of the of these copyrights. I've been. Every couple of months, I have to file an appeal for YouTube for a remix of a Charlie Chaplin uh, clip of a film from 1922. I mean, <laughs> are they still in threat of like losing their intellectual property right from something that was 90 years ago or whatever the math was? It's, yeah. It just doesn't even make sense. And, and and I know when you know I work with um, you know I've done some workshops with elementary school kids. It's just ridiculous to explain to them the meanings of these different licenses. They just want to create stuff. Yeah, and it just gets in the way. Uh, it, it's it's so completely absurd, and and really the best way to show the absurdity of it. Uh, may, may I screen share for a moment, Christina? You, yeah, as long as Google Hangouts will let you. Yeah, I believe it's going to. Okay. Um, you, you are all probably familiar. Can you see this? Yeah. Yep. Copyright. If you're not familiar with this, this is a great resource maintained by Cornell University. 
And this is, this is a table which takes a first stab at helping you determine whether a work has fallen out of copyright in the United States. I'm just going to scroll through it um, slowly just to make the point that, you know, I, I think a normal person, when a normal person thinks about copyright, the experience they bring to it is their experience with the rest of the world where there are a set of first principles. You know, those first principles kind of motivate the rest of what happens. And if I can understand one or two basic principles, then I can sort of infer the, the remainder of the structure around that. Like if you understand something about the way gravity works, then you can infer a lot about what you need to do to build things that will stand up or how hard you need to throw a ball or, or something like that. There, there's just no first principle to copyright or to copyright term because it's just this overlapping mishmash of different deals cut by different industries with the federal government and every time some copyright's about to expire somebody comes in and you know most recently and infamously in the US it was Sonny Bono um, you know on be oh thank you sorry uh, <laughs> from California acting on behalf of Disney whose you know copyright in Mickey Mouse was about to expire to say let's extend copyright for 20 more years and so you have this mishmash of is something in the public domain or not well that depends was it created by a person or an entity and was it before this year or after that year were they a foreign national was it originally registered was it never I mean there is no first principle that you can understand and from that understanding intuit the rest of the law the way that you would want there to be uh, and and these continuing extensions uh, you know are and and it really doesn't bode well because in Eldred versus Ashcroft, when Larry Lessig himself went to the Supreme Court and argued against the extension and says the U.S. Constitution says four limited times, you know that's the language that the uh, you know that we can grant these limited monopolies in, for the purpose of promoting useful arts and sciences for limited times. Larry's argument was if every time it's about to expire, we extend it for 20 years. That's not for limited times. This is this is not constitutional, and unfortunately, the the court came back and said, well, they only extended it for 20 more years. That's not an unlimited time. So strictly speaking, it, it still meets the test of being granted for a limited time. So unless there's some really radical, you know, changes in the way the court thinks, we would just keep extending it for 20 years every time it's about to expire, and we'll still continue to call that a limited time and say that, you know, that it's appropriate. I just had a similar issue in Canada um, because it's the same thing in the U.S. Like, how do you even find out if it was renewed, if the copyright wasn't renewed? That's actually a really hard thing to find out. Yeah, in fact, if you there's uh, James Boyle's book, The Public Domain, has got a bunch of great resources on this. He has some estimates, and that you can find estimates other places too, um, of the number of works that are what are referred to as orphan works. So the copyright hasn't expired on them but it's literally impossible to find out who the original copyright holder was. Mm. So no one is publishing the material. There's no way to get a, there are no way to get new copies. There's no legal way to get a copy. Um, there's no way to get the right to produce new copies because was it copyrighted? Was it not copyrighted? Who holds the copyright now through some inheritance to somebody's brother's dog's goldfish? or however that chain played out. So there's this huge mass of work where even if you're willing to pay to use the work, it's, it's just impossible to find out. And particularly, you know, since burn, I mean, it used to be at least that you had to register for a copyright if you wanted copyright protection, and that gave you some kind of leg up. But now where everything is automatically copyrighted, you don't even have to register. There's no place you could even potentially go to find out who registered for the copyright on something. It's, a, it's just a giant mess. So, David, I wonder if you could also say a little bit about um, the open content definition that, that you've got. We're going to read about it next week in the course, but just say something briefly for anybody yeah, who's not familiar with that. Revised. Yes, I saw there's a fifth R. Um, so the open content definition is mostly about the five R's. The open content definition essentially says that uh, if you have a creative work whose copyright license grants you the 5R permissions, then it's appropriate to call that work open content. And the 5Rs are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. 
So what that means is, um, now remember, th this is all about copyright. Typically, copyright is going to prohibit you from uh, either making copies or distributing copies or engaging in any kind of public performance of the material contained in the copy or of making any kind of derivative work of, uh, of, the, of the original. So open license is all about kind of undoing um, each of those pieces. So the thought, originally it was four R's, just reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And you know the right to reuse is the right to make public performance, to write to to take that lesson plan and stand up in front of a class and do something with it, um, or to read it to your class or, or whatever it is that you wanted to to use it in a number of ways. The the right to revise is a right to take whatever it is. Let's say it's a uh, a, a chapter from an open textbook, to take that chapter and open it up and make changes to it to pull out the picture of the desert and put in a picture of mountains because my students live near mountains and that'll speak more directly to them. So making adaptations. A remix is about taking two different pieces of open content and combining them uh, into something new. And then redistribute, of course, is about being able to, to give out copies that you have made, either of the revised thing, the remixed thing, or the verbatim thing to others. So for a long time, the open content definition focused on those four R's, but recently uh, we've seen a shift in business models, both in broader media industries and in music and in movies, like with Netflix or Spotify, but also in educational publishing um, to services where you can stream content, but you never actually get a copy of the content. So like with Netflix movies, you can you know watch the stream, but you, know, you don't ever actually get a copy of the movie. Or the same with a lot of digital textbooks. You go, you log into a site, you can use the textbook there, but at some point after your license expires, your password quits working and you lose access. So I, I've, I've become pretty concerned about um, emergent business models built around the idea of access and not ownership. Mm. And so added this fifth R, which is retain which is that an open content license ought to give you permission to make and keep make and keep and control and own a, your own copy of the work. If you can't make a copy, you can't make changes to it. If you can't make and own a copy, you can't remake. You can't do these other things with it. So you might argue that retain was implied by the four R's, um, but I think I, I I think the way things are going, we have to focus more and more on the idea of retain. If we're going to protect those other uh, the other R's, so the, so the open content definition is really about those five R's, and then there is some language around this idea of the Alms analysis, um, and that there are there are technical choices publishers can make. Um, well, okay, sorry. So before I get to Alms analysis. In the licenses that grant you those five R permissions, people will sometimes tack on additional restrictions and say you only have these five R permissions if you agree to meet these other requirements, like if you give attribution to the original author, or if you relicense your derivative works under the same license that you received the original work under, or if you refrain from making commercial use of the derivative or, or something like that. So. Yeah, I think if you get those five R permissions, you, that it's appropriate to call it open content. But then I think it's also appropriate to say that that open content can be more or less open, to the extent that the license places additional restrictions on you in your ability to exercise your five R rights. And then Alms analysis is about helping people think through the technology choices they make, which may or may not interfere in people exercising the five R rights that the license grants them. So I might have a set of educational videos or simulations or something that I put out under a CC BY license, but I publish them in Flash, and I only make the Swift file available and never the FLA. So even though you have permission to make adaptations and changes and things like that, if I don't ever actually distribute the source file, it becomes very, very difficult for you to exercise the permissions that I've given you under the license. So there are technolo technological considerations along with the uh, license considerations. Hmm. Well, in, in terms of retain, there's this little site called YouTube. Um, I've heard of it. And 
I mean, there's a thousand ways to download videos from YouTube. None of them come from YouTube. Yes. In some ways, they're I, they're, they're like looking past that, and, and so it's, it's a squishy territory because, you know, they know this is going on, and you know, th there was this thing that happened a couple of weeks or months ago. Um, Dean Shiresky shared this story of a teacher who found out this little clip he did of teaching his students green screen um, was part of a montage that Google produced for a commercial, I think, that was shown at the Academy Awards. So it was like Google themselves resampled YouTube clips without getting attribution, without asking permission, and published it as a commercial. And it's like, there it is. They're sanctioning reuse of Google content, which I know they have the rights to. That's in the... the Terms legal the terms of use, they can do that. But to me that was like, they're sanctioning Remix and, you know, but it's so vague, uh, you know, about what goes on on their site. And I ripped stuff, I download stuff all the time from YouTube and, um, and, and I'm, not, I'm not about to stop doing it. No, I mean, it was a long fight to finally get YouTube to add the choice of a CC attribution license. Now when you up to upload a YouTube video, you can choose the, the default, of course, is standard YouTube license where you can right. choose what you can buy. Even for uh, even for videos that are licensed CC BY, there's no official way to download them. Yeah. Even though even though YouTube has made it possible for the video's author to tell you you have the right to download it. Right. Yeah. So interesting stuff. Yeah. And the the remix the uh, the remix culture around YouTube is is fabulous, and we could do a whole semester just on that. I'm sure. Well, what's the um... You know, where I get real fuzzy is, like, the provisions for satire because, you know, in DS-106, that's all we do in a way. Um, but that's not, like, a blanket license either. No. <laughs> no. And, I mean, th things like criticism or satire, things like that, fall under the fair use provision. Right. Which, actually, you know, there's no concrete language around fair use anywhere. Every time you think you have a fair use claim, you have to go to court to find out if you really, if you actually do or not. And pay for it. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah and, and pay for it. And so, you know, again, another reason we need open. Um, when, when the entire universe of things is automatically copyrighted at the moment of its creation, mm. um, you know, and in a world where not enough people know enough about open licenses... Um, fair use gives you sort of a plausible, you know, and and the worst thing ever is the propagation of these rules of thumb, right? Like, oh, yeah, my librarian told me it's fair use if I use less than a paragraph. My librarian told me as long as I use less than 15 seconds, it's fair use. Like, no. <laughs> there's nothing anywhere in statute, in precedent, there, there's nothing that tells you as long as you use less than a paragraph, it's definitely going to qualify as fair use. We invent these little rules of thumb, and then they get passed on, you know, as if they were, as if they've been approved by Congress or, you know, verified by the Supreme Court or something. And it's absolutely not the case in any instance that that's true. Anytime you do something you're not legally allowed to do and claim fair use, you know, if it really came down to it, the only way you could find out if use was fair was to go have a judge tell you if it is or isn't. No, just the worst thing that can happen if you use something and it's not actually fair use or, you know, you, you violate a copyright in some way um, is, I guess this is obviously going to depend on the country, but a number of the people here are in Canada or the U.S. and Canada has some similar rules, although there are some differences, um, is what? You're going to be asked to take it down or you're going to be fined or what? Well, think think about you know, think about the lawsuits during Napster, right? Yeah, yeah. So those are people sharing copies of a three-minute-long copyrighted work that could have been legally purchased for ninety-nine cents. The market value was ninety-nine cents, hmm. and they were they were having fines of a quarter million dollars per song. Oh my God! Put on them for having <laughs> shared something with the market value of ninety-nine cents, right? Wow. Okay. So, I think I think in Canada I was told um, if I put something on my course website that is that and I violate copyright I can be charged up to two thousand dollars maybe maybe it was five thousand I don't remember. Yeah, but, I'm not a I'm not a lawyer so I. Yeah, 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 I was just trying to get a ballpark estimate. 
<laughs> no, well, at least in the U.S., it's, yeah. Yeah. It's but not, let me, I, judge. I'm going to throw it out to others because we've just been chatting, but, but anyone can break in and have a question or comment. No, I just have an, um, from personal experience, when I was in, in graduate school, um, the, the other uh, researcher who I shared an office with, she illegally downloaded um, a movie. And initially, um, our university, initially when, when uh, these big um, company, media companies came after students, our university was like they were not handing over like, you know, the IP addresses. But then they eventually started to do that. And the initial, um, their initial interaction was to make people sign uh, a letter saying that they will never download a movie from this company ever again. So that was the, uh, so that's what we, we they had us to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, the irony in writing, like, if, if I'm writing a research paper, I can quote you and cite you and, and reuse a portion of your work in my writing. It's totally acceptable. Yes. Yeah. But um, not not if he made a video. Yeah. You can't sample a minute of his video if, well, I mean, David, you probably could because he would give you a open license, but <laughs> if he hadn't, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't, like, quote part of a video by using that part, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Let, let's let's veer away from questions about what is and isn't <laughs> in terms of copyright because I'm not going to give you any good answers there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the answers nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I guess David, you were talking about these, you know, propagations of rules of thumb, and that was about copyright, but it could also be about openness or or open licenses or anything and people giving out misinformation because they don't have the right information and and one of the difficulties I found at least on my own campus is when I talk about openness and open education the only people that ever come to those talks are people who already know <laughs> and are already interested and so I'm talking to people who know everything I'm going to say um, so uh, getting the word out <laughs> so that we get correct information out yeah. Uh, to people who don't already understand what we're talking about is, is a really difficult point for me, and I'm curious what anybody else thinks. Yeah, well, nobody cares about copyright. <laughs> that, that's clear just by people's behavior. So <laughs> ha having a seminar where, I mean, your, your, library, your academic librarians probably put on a seminar once a semester about copyright 101 or copyright basics, or something, and it's attended by no one. Right, but at least when the university gets sued for people having downloaded movies, the library can say, "Hey, we provide copyright training to our community you know, every semester." Well, right. and nearly all the time, it's you know basically you're in kind of the seminar and learn you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. Um, right. And so, I mean, who's who, that does? That's not attractive to anybody. That's not fun. Uh, I, I do remember when I was at Maricopa, they had a faculty project where they they tried to flip it around to say these are the things you can do um, to sort of give you an idea and that's you know what a lot of the people do who um, are in this uh, this chat hangout um, there's this whole you know it's a whole attitudinal shift that's more important than that than well, so, so you have to start from somewhere else from something that people care about right so if you've got faculty that actually care about say whether students can afford their textbooks or not yeah then you can start a conversation around textbook affordability and you can introduce the idea of open there and then you can kind of back in mm -hmm to what open means through the affordability conversation. Or where, um, if it's a, yeah. you know, a social justice and equity issue and there are people who are excited about that, you can introduce open in that context and you can back into the copyright parts of it that way. You, you have to meet people where they are in terms of the where their passion is and what it is they're trying to accomplish and help them see th this is the pragmatic piece of it. This is why, this is why I'm an open guy, not a free guy. Um, you have to see, help them see where the value is and what they're trying to accomplish. And from there, help them understand what open is. And, oh, by the way, in addition to helping you solve this problem you're trying to solve, look at these three other things you can do now because you chose to be open in your practice to solve this problem that you had at first. That's a great idea. You can almost never, I mean, 
we can say, hey, open licenses reverse the evils of the burn convention. I mean, nobody's going to come to that workshop. <laughs> no, and, and Apostolos just point, put it in the chat um, that, and you guys can see it, but the viewers probably can't see it, that uh, some people don't, faculty, he says, I've met, don't care about other people's copyright, but they slap a copyright symbols on all their materials and guard it for dear life. So they don't, I mean, it, it can easily be the case that people don't care about copyright until it's theirs, right? Yeah. So I don't know if there's any way to back into it through that. I, yeah, no, because that would just make them want to keep their copyright, so never mind. <laughs> Well, I mean, copyrights and educational materials are like lottery tickets, right? You know, one of my favorite questions to ask really big groups that I speak to is to ask, you know, who's ever published, been an author or a co-author on a textbook and have them, you know, two-thirds of the room will raise their hand and then I'll ask, yeah. how many of you have ever made a single mortgage payment based on the royalties you received from the 500 hours you put into writing that textbook? And, Maybe two hands, you know, out of originally 300 are, are left in the air. Just, everybody has this dream that they're going to hit it big. My copyright, and nobody else can teach, you know, factoring polynomials quite like I can, and I'm, I'm going to become a millionaire. Well, I know, yeah, uh, when I was starting teaching DS106, I, I would introduce Creative Commons really early, and... My students, it, it didn't even make sense to them. I mean, first of all, you know, why should I share my stuff? People are going to steal it and make money. And so I just stopped doing it up front, and I tried to create experiences where they were exposed to what they could get from the material that was out there open. Um, some of them eventually got it, but you know, photograph professional photographers can't even make money off of their photos. I mean, so nobody's going to get rich off of a photo. I mean, that's just that's just gone. I mean, there, there's almost there's like three professional photographers in the world left. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but who got paid full time to take pictures? It's crazy. Yeah. So I, I like this idea, Ellen, that that at least with students, because I have the same experience that, you know, I. I I haven't really tried to push the Creative Commons thing with students yet, but I plan to, but I can see the pushback that could happen. But if you start them with seeing how they can use what other people have created yeah. in their own work and then see the value of that, and then why wouldn't you, you know, share as well? That seems like a good way to... And believe me, I mean, yeah, I would love to get a lot of money for my photos, but I get more out of someone just saying, Hey, you know, look, I, I thanks for your photo. I used it here. I mean, that goes such a long way. Yeah. And, and you know, and I'm not doing this to make money off of the the media itself. Yeah. Um, so but, Susan's put a question in the chat about the difference between free and open. So just you know, just to respond to that. Um. It it depends on whose vocabulary you're using. Unfortunately, um, you know, if, if you're speaking from the open side of things, then open means a, a resource is free. In, in other words, it doesn't cost you anything. Plus, you get this set of copyright permissions. You get these 5R permissions in addition to getting the resource for free. Um, but if you're speaking from the what was originally the free software side and is now the the content analog is the free culture side. Um, you know, they make a distinction between free, as in beer, something that doesn't cost anything, versus free, as in speech. In other words, the principle of freedom, the idea of being free to do a range of things. Um, if you asked, if you asked a person who had kind of come up intellectually through the free camp, um, they would tell you that my definition of open and their definition of free are essentially the same thing. And so that, that makes, for lots of, makes for lots of confusion. But in just the normal everyday use of the word free, the way, like if I told you that there's a free textbook, you would think that it was a textbook you didn't have to pay money for. Free is a necessary attribute of open, but not sufficient. It would have to be freely available to you, plus grant you those 5R permissions. That would be open. So, Does it make sense to think of that in terms of open access versus, I don't know what you would call the other thing, because open access usually just is you can read it or watch it or something for free, right? 
Right, so you know, we used to make a distinction, maybe it's still a useful one. We used to make the distinction between 2R open and 4R open um, in that a lot of open access, like research articles, you're free to copy and you're free to redistribute. You're free to reuse and redistribute, but you're not free to revise and remix. Right. Right, so um, you know, basically all you're allowed to do is make verbatim copies and swap those around. Um, but even that, of course, is significantly better than having to pay $35 a copy to read articles that may or may not contain information that you need, you know. Exactly. But yeah, but the open access movement ha hasn't quite made it all the way to four, all the way to five R yet. They're kind of at three R okay. in, in the current in the current language. You can make a copy and you can own it and keep it. You can yeah. use it. You can redistribute it, but you may not make any changes to it. Got it. Uh, in, including, you know, you, you can't translate it into other languages, which is problematic. But at the same time, you don't want somebody opening your article, you know, changing your result from being statistically insignificant to significant or vice versa, and then saying, hey, here's my here's my adaptation of Christine's article and circulate it. And you know, I mean you can you can imagine how that could wreak some yeah. havoc downstream. Yeah. So Paul Olivier uh, asked a question in the chat, David. Um, he can't get his video or audio to work. So it says, if I understood you right, David, the main difference you were making for your own choice, free slash open, was strategic and convincing others? Question mark. <laughs> so no. Okay. Uh, not strategic and convincing others. It just, there's a, there's a moral grandstanding um, that goes on in, on the open side, excuse me, on the free side. <laughs> it says, freedom is a principle that all moral people should be, you know, fully committed to. And proprietary software, there's no place in the world for proprietary software. Freedom is something we should all be committed to. And if you aren't behind the idea of freedom, then it's because you hate bunnies and, you know, cat memes and other things that we're all supposed to love. Whereas the, the, on the open side, instead of saying it's a universal good which should be respected in every case, it's very much, there, there's very much a sense of, I can see how there are actual practical benefits that accrue to me in this sense, and I can imagine times, I'm shaking a screwdriver right now, <laughs> and I can, imagine, I can imagine times when I would, not, I would choose not to be open. And that there's nothing moral, morally inferior about making that choice in this particular circumstance for these reasons. Mm. Um, that open is very pragmatic, where the free is very religious. You know, there there are certain commandments which must always be obeyed, and if you don't, you're if you break the commandments, you're a sinner. Mm. Um, is is now I'm sure if there was someone else here, they would give a better articulated defense of the free position. But in my interactions with free people, that's always how I come away feeling. I've only interacted with open the open side, so... Should we call, let's call Stephen in. <laughs> H5! <laughs> They've already done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's, there's been a lot of d debate back and forth. So, anybody else with questions in the Hangout or well, on it, Twitter? I mean, it seems like there, there's some leverage and movement in in the textbook approach, and, and it's a rational one. Do you, can you see anything else, David, that might be an avenue to breaking open some more attitudes? Yeah, so there's some work we're doing right now with a, a competency-based program that we're working on, which I'm really excited about. Um, you know, this idea of competency-based education, of tying uh, academic yeah, yeah. to the achievement of actual learning outcomes as opposed to just spending a certain amount of time in a seat, which is a super novel idea that no one's ever thought of before, mm. but is now gaining some traction. Um, at least in the U.S., uh, just a couple of years ago, our, um, Department of our Federal Department of Education changed its guidelines so that people can use federal financial aid money to attend programs that are competency-based instead of seat time or credit hour based, which has started to crack that open here in the U.S., so there are more schools that are experimenting with competency-based programs. But for all, well, 
I think every school, every major competency-based program, I think, is looking at open educational resources as a way to support students in achieving the competencies. There's not a single program that has open sourced its competencies. So like I'm not this, getting that. So here, here's the thing that you have to learn, and here are the five sub things we're going to judge you on to determine whether you've accomplished the learning outcome or not. Those list of learning outcomes and that additional detail, everyone keeps copyrighted and proprietary. But then they give out open ed educational resources to people to learn the things they need to learn to, in order to achieve that goal. Hmm. So every time somebody wants to start, if, if your university is thinking, you know, we should start a, a competency-based program in philosophy, what would that look like? That would be interesting. Um, then you'd say, okay, well, our only choice, literally, is to sit down from scratch, whole cloth, and write out all the competencies for every required and every elective course in the program. And because there's so much upfront work in that, the programs are really slow coming online because there's a huge expense involved. But if there's an open source set of competencies for microeconomics and for biology for non-majors and another set for you know, intro to psychology, and it was out there, and you could take it as your starting place and quickly tweak it, and a week later have the set of competencies you wanted to use rather than it being a three-semester-long project for your faculty to engage in. We'd see a lot more um, experimentation happening in competency-based a lot more quickly. Um, and I'm, I'm always one for seeing more experimentation happening more quickly. So you know the, the OER piece of it is well-established, particularly with um, I think we keep saying the words open textbooks, even though what we really mean is open educational resources, but faculty know how to adopt textbooks, so we speak the language of open textbooks to them to get in the door in order to have those conversations. Um, but in some ways, I think the next really interesting frontier is around open competencies and us finally getting over kind of uh, misguided concerns about assessment and seeing more and more openly licensed assessments uh, become available. Those are the two areas I'm watching pretty closely right now. So there's, there's a question on Twitter that nobody else can see unless you're monitoring Twitter. It says, uh, there's been lots of talk recently about open versus connected with regard to learning. What are your thoughts? So that's for you, David, or anybody else. Uh, so. That like, like all virtues, connected can become a vice when taken to extremes. Right? So there, there was a time when you'd go to search for openly licensed biology materials on Google, and you could find four. And somehow overnight, the next day when you went back to search for openly licensed uh, biology materials on Google, it was 42 million. And like... And they're all interconnected together, and it's this great web of content that's cross-linking, and you can traverse the whole thing, and it's all connected. But at some point, more nodes in the network and more connections between nodes in the network stops being a virtue and starts becoming a problem. It just becomes noise. because I mean, if you fully connected the entire graph, OK, you know, it's fully connected. Every node is directly linked to every other node. Well. I, I guess I'm just the, the, the point I'm doing a very poor job of making is I definitely think that there's value in connectedness, but I think the kind of I guess I guess so I guess I have the same feeling about connectedness that I have about open. I think there are pragmatic benefits to it. I think there are ways to do it appropriately. I think seeking it as its own end as opposed to being a means to an end of supporting more effective learning, better learning for students. Just when, when once you make a religion out of something, it becomes dangerous and scary. Uh, um, I, I'm a big fan of connected, but not for the sake of being connected. I'm a fan of using it kind of strategically to accomplish learning goals. Whether, whether it's me using it strategically to help you support your goals or you using it strategically to, to support your own goals. But the idea that like the ideal world would be if every node was fully connected to every other node in the graph, I, I disagree. You know, I think there's got to be some curation and some structure there, which implies somebody doing some trimming and some pruning, or somebody going out of their way to make some additional connections. Um, 
I don't I don't think full connectivity is actually the the end goal. I can see Alan making a wide range of faces in his little thumbnail. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have no rebuttal there, Dave. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, Fasola said um, that's how I feel about OER repositories. Lost in a sea of stuff. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then I said, well, actually, not in philosophy, but that's a different issue because there's hardly anything. <laughs> but, All you have is a Sanford encyclopedia, and it's not even really open. I know, I know, but yeah. it's... But, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Lumen has had a number of schools approach us and say, would you be willing to offer a repository that we would pay you to curate that had no more than 20 items per discipline? <laughs> Ooh, whoa. You know, it's no. like... Because I don't want 40 million biology items. I want 20 really good ones. Mm. And if you just okay. find 20 good ones and kind of keep that list fresh with the 20 best ones in there, I, uh, I'd pay for that. Yeah. People say, you know. We haven't done that. But, okay. but there does seem to be a demand. You know, there's, some, there's some spot in the middle between only three resources and 40 million resources that is more useful than either of those. Yeah, Paul, I agree. I mean, it, this idea that so Paul said in the chat that curating might be one of the, the biggest values that, that faculty bring. And it's, it's the, that's what we've always brought, right? I mean, except for the super lazy faculty member who just adopts one textbook and never does anything else and just reads chapter one in week one and reads chapter two in week two. I mean, faculty really are about, let's pull this research article, let's, you know, we'll read this from the book on this week and we're going to read this article and watch this video in, in the same week. And then we're going to read these two research articles here and watch this video and then I'm going to have this guest speaker come in in three. And I mean, a good faculty member always has been about curating resources, putting them, not just scoping it down so that it's not like go out and read about photosynthesis. But it's, I mean, instructional design is about scope and sequence, right? What do you include? inside each little bundle of time and what order do you put those experiences in and we've always done that and it's just gotten slightly more complicated now that we have access to 40 million things instead of 12 like we used to before. The Apostolos had another question earlier on it probably scrolled up um, in terms oh. let's see oops it scrolled back down hold on in terms of open, one of the areas I'm pondering about is academic publishing and the required gravitas uh, to obtain tenure or even get a position offer. How do we get academics to publish only in open terms and get institutions to recognize that academic output? Um, Anybody? So, so today, that's still a game of chicken, right? I mean, I played it. I, I was a tenured faculty member before I quit my job in order to become an adjunct. And <laughs> And we can design an intervention. Which was a great choice, by the way. But also um, allows me to make progress. Oop, uh, somebody's. Somebody's YouTube video is playing over their mic, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm uh, getting it. I'm sorry. I'll turn that okay, off. Okay, there you go. That off. <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry. But, um, you know, when I went up for tenure, I built out my list of all my publications. Um, but the thing I really focused on in terms of providing supporting data around those publications was the Google Scholar citation count. And I included, I included a lot of things on that list that were never published in a peer-reviewed output, mm. um, but that had Google Scholar citation counts of over 100. Mm. And basically, the argument I made in my tenure and promotion package was, look, I, I, if you'd like, I can report an impact factor for a journal, and that impact factor will tell you that on average, over the last five years, we can expect that each article published in this journal might have been cited this many times. And that big average calculated over a year's worth of data will give you a proxy indicator of the potential impact of my work. Or, I can give you Google Scholar's direct count of the actual impact of my work. So instead of telling you that by publishing it here, it's likely to be referenced 3.4 times, I can tell you that this chapter has been referenced 800 times. Mm -hmm. Now, which would you prefer? 
Right? You, you, you want this crazy indirect proxy that looks at other people's work and the impact it had? Or do you want to actually know the, work, the impact that my work had? And not as calculated in some rigged way by me, but Google's a fairly neutral third party. Right now, I was at a point in my career where I could have gotten another job if they decided they didn't like me and they could have fired me and something else. So I was willing to, to play that game a little bit. And I think more faculty need to be willing to do that um, because the idea that we're getting judged, the quality of our work is getting judged based on some five-year running average of other people's work in a journal that we happen to put our article in. It's just complete. Today, it's complete insanity. 30 years ago, it was the best measure we had. Mm. Right, and so it's this idea of the good being the enemy of the better, or the better being the enemy of the best, or whatever. Um, and it's academia, right? We're super slow to change, and it's easy to play the game of trying. If you can get your work into a high impact journal, then it doesn't actually matter if it ever impacts anything or not, because the whole game is just about getting in a high impact journal. If we can flip that conversation over and make it be about, actually, instead of poor proxies for quality, let's judge the direct impact of my work. And I think that's a really hard argument for someone to argue against. You know, why, should, why should we judge the value of my work based on this other proxy when we have a direct measure? Please explain to me how that's fair. And when you deny me tenure, let's go to arbitra arbitration. Let's talk with them about why it's fair. Because I, you know, I, I can show you these 10 things with citation counts, over 100, none of which were published in a peer-reviewed outlet. Is my job to publish in peer-reviewed outlet, or is my job to have an impact on the field? You know, which is it that you want from me? And actually, if you don't care about impact on the field, you just want me to publish in a particular set of 13 journals that you've deemed to be the highest quality, yeah, I'm not really interested in working here anymore if that's the, you know, the, the standard that I'm going to be measured against. So anyway, when you publish things, all of that miniature ramp to say that when you publish things in the open, more people read them. And if more people read them, they're more likely to cite them. And if you want your work to have an impact, you should maximize the number of people who are going to read it. Your work can never impact people who don't read it. So if the universe of people who can read your work is the people who subscribe to some Springer journal that costs $7,800 a year, versus the universe of people who can read your work being people who can type in a Google box, you have a better chance of impacting people, which means you're actually going to impact more people, which means that you should be getting more credit for actually impacting people. I, I think then you're asking, I got my PhD in, the, in English literature, that would be something, a completely radical move in some of the humanities. Um, most, most, most articles in the humanities cite the same, the same big names. Um, I think a lot of people who have done quite well coming up through the tenure system will be against that because a lot of people don't cite their articles. Um, what they're looking for is um, publishing in top tier journals as opposed to wide impact and then some of the the language of, of um, literary criticism would have to be abandoned if you're looking for a wide impact that would be a really radical move for in the in some of the humanities in literature in particular yeah yeah it would I mean it and you can imagine legitimate arguments on both sides saying, how do we value, how do we choose to value work that demonstrably has no impact? <laughs> and, and there are arguments for valuing it very highly for some reasons, and there are arguments for valuing it not at all for other reasons. And, you know, impact factor lets us avoid that conversation. Um, but eventually, you know, the, the strength of argument, the, the the, the momentum behind the idea that we actually want our faculty to be impacting the world, um, as opposed to just kind of talking back and forth to each other in a, an expensive echo chamber of a journal that costs $10,000 to subscribe to. Um, 
you know, we're, we're going to end up needing to have that conversation at some point. And, and I should say my undergraduate degree is a BFA in music, so it's not like I'm antagonistic toward the humanities. Oh, no, no, no. I, I get that. I mean, I totally understand. I, and I do, I think we're already beginning to have that conversation with libraries saying, well, we don't have space for more books that no one is borrowing. You know, so I think that conversation is in the very early stages. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I do think it will be radical. I mean, if it happens. Yeah, it would uh, be. Oh, makes total sense to me. <laughs> when it happens. Yeah. So we are we're a little bit over time, but there's one more question in the chat. If if you guys want to stay, if David can stay. I'm good. Okay. So uh, this is from Paul Olivier. He says, uh, David, pushing on this idea that we were just talking about, do you think academics who publish in the open should attempt to own data about the impact it has? Yeah. Paul, in what sense do you mean own the data, if you can respond in the chat briefly? Probably typing. Yeah, I wasn't sure either. I mean, I'm, I'm very keen on the idea that we ought to own, I mean, that's why there's a fifth R now. We ought to own everything that we can own. And we ought, we ought to give other people permission to own everything that, uh, you know, that we feel comfortable letting them own. But I think in judging impact, it's different for me to tell you the citation count. If I can send you the link where you can go to Google and verify it, versus me saying, trust me, I downloaded all the data and processed it myself. Let me tell you what the impact of my work is. Mm. It seems like the there's an opportunity for incentives to get misaligned there and people be uh, uh, an opportunity for people to be tempted to behave badly. But but I'm not sure I understand what you're meaning by own the data about impact. Yeah, that was the question, Paul. He said he was in and out and he might have missed what you were asking. <laughs> know how many people ac accessed it from where yeah, well, so the, the Google Scholar data isn't um, web analytics data, right? Google is crawling other articles and seeing who's made, what other articles have made reference to the thing that you publish. So, um, of course, you, you, I mean, if you're self-publishing and self-archiving your scholarly work, then you can own um, copies of all the Google Analytics data and things like that, or you can keep all the raw Apache logs if you know, if you want to get down to that level on how many people are coming and where they're coming from and things like that too. But, but I do think the opportunity for incentive misalignment here is pretty significant. Yeah, that third party or somehow otherwise neutral uh, party doing it makes a lot of sense, just for this at least. Yeah. He is everyone familiar with Google Scholar? Well, not, not the Google Scholar part where you go and search for academic works, the Google Scholar profiles where you can see the impact that work has had. Are people familiar with that? Anybody who's in, <laughs> who's in academia? <laughs> okay. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Which I haven't used it uh, at all. I haven't looked at my profile, really, at all. So. Yeah. But I think I might now for... Um, go own it. Promotion, yeah. That, that's a really great idea. I need to go own it. I, I wish more people would make this argument. Yeah. The, the more people that make it, the more momentum it gets. And about the... about I mean, without being overly, overly rude to administrators, you know, the 7th or 12th or 18th time they hear this argument, it might start to sink in. Yeah. Paul says, I guess my point here is more with quote-unquote free... Owning all this data allows our community to build more tools, more useful tools. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess I, have, I guess I have to noodle on that one more. I'm still not sure exactly what he's getting at, but maybe if I think about it longer, I'll figure it out. So maybe offline, Paul. Hmm. Well, where it's a... Uh... Seven minutes after the hour. We said it would be an hour. So unless anyone has another question they would like to ask real quick or comment they would like to make. No? Uh, there was something on Twitter. Uh, let me just double check. Uh, no, it wasn't a question. Okay. All right.
Well, thank you so much to David and to everybody else for joining in. And uh, this will this has been recorded and will be available on YouTube for uh, later viewing for those who weren't able to make it live. And yeah, thanks for all your questions and comments. And uh, we'll have another one of these in a couple weeks for the course. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Oh, I'm going to stop the broadcast. All right. Okay. Bye.